Oh, kia ora All Saints Fano. It's Guy here this week in uh, part seven of our gospel series as we've been working our way through the last few weeks. Of course, we have um, kind of followed through kind of what it means for the gospel in the city and uh, the gospel um, amongst us and what it means in terms of idolatry and the things around us and community uh, and our work. Uh, And we're just so excited about this journey and the way that it's reshaping our own hearts and renewing our own lives. This week, we're looking at the gospel and justice. Uh, And so what I'd love you to do is if you're in your house church or your prayer group or wherever you are, I'd love you to pause it now and look uh, to your Bible to the book of Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 to 37, which is going to shape part of our talk today and possibly our discussion afterwards. So pause me now and I'll see you back in a second. Cool, great to have you back with me. Hopefully you've looked through again the parable of the Good Samaritan. We've had this this year already, uh, but this way we're looking at it in regards to um, the gospel and justice. Now, for many years, uh, Summer and I lived in Cambodia. Summer was there first. She met me and then sort of encouraged me to come over after we got married. And we lived there for many years, Summer working in anti-trafficking uh, with survivors of human trafficking. And I was working in a youth working space with the Anglican Church of Cambodia. Uh, but, you know, when you live in a third world developing nation, you are confronted by the injustices of the world. You are confronted by oppression, by slavery, by um, greed, by selfishness, by the trauma of the past that's impacting people's daily lives. It happens all around the world. And and any one of you who has lived overseas will be aware of exactly what this looks like and how this operates. Um, So today we're looking at justice and the gospel. And what does that mean? What does it mean for us What does God mean by that? What does that mean for our relationship with God? And what does it mean for those who are being impacted by the injustices of the world, by oppression of the world, by the uncomforts of the world? And how do we play our role in that? I'd love to start by looking at the word shalom. Now, shalom is a word that gets thrown and banded around a lot in Christian world. You know, I'm sure you've heard it before and I'm sure you've got some kind of idea of what it means. It's a really rich, rich word that means peace in essence. But it's not like the word that we use for peace, which really boils down to the absence of hostility. Shalom means way more than that. Shalom means the presence of joy, the light, the blessing, the health. Shalom means the total flourishing in absolutely every dimension, physically, relationally, socially, and spiritually. In essence, shalom is the way that things ought to be. Now, one way that we can think about shalom is within kind of the context of like right relationships. You know, we've talked about this again this year too, as we as we sort of looked at the Beatitudes and as we look at kind of um, the way that Jesus outlined those and, you know, blessed are you, blessed are the righteous people who are in right relationship. Shalom is about right relationships, right relationships with God, right relationships with others and right relationships with the surrounding world. If they are all to interweave together, If they are right, if shalom is right, if things are right, if the world is ordered and right, it all interweaves together. Uh, Think about it like this. Maybe you can conjure this image up in your head. Um, You can think about it like a piece of fabric. You know, each piece of thread goes under and over and under and over and forms this interwoven and strong piece of fabric. Beautiful in a way. You may have watched The Whale Rider in the past, and of course there's a scene, a beautiful scene in The Whale Rider, where the piece of rope snaps, and he's talking about the whakapapa, and the way that the threads or the pieces of the rope weave together and intertwine together in order to make it strong. You could think about a flax basket maybe. It's Matariki this weekend, the Māori New Year, the, the, the 
the coming of the, the harvest. Think about a woven flax basket, the way that each piece of flax weaves together over and under, over and under. You pick your analogy. Think about it like this in terms of the human body. And many of you know that I've just uh, this week uh, had um, a pretty routine surgery just to help with um, sort of quality of life around a few things. But if you think about the human body and the organs and how they all operate and function together and when it's all working right and well, you have physical health, physical shalom. But if disease comes or your body isn't quite functioning as well as it should or it's not quite in order, then you have the breakdown of shalom. It's not working properly. Think about your family. If you have a family that loves one another, it's forgiving, it's honest with each other, it's speaking the truth in love, you have relational shalom. But if there's fighting or anger or the breaking down of relationships, then you have the breakdown in relationship shalom. It's not working as the way it should be. And if we want people to experience shalom, then we must reweave the fabric of society in a way that reveals Christ to people. You know, maybe there's unhappiness in our society or social breakdown or there's hunger or poverty. We must take our time and our love and our money and ourselves and we must plunge ourselves into those places and reweave the fabric with the gifts of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, and self-control, you know, those, and also with the resources of the gospel. That's what the Bible means when it talks about doing justice, plunging ourselves, our time, our money, our resources, all of us into those places. Now, how about this? The Old Testament links justice and love really closely together. When God says, love your neighbor as yourself, which is out of Leviticus 19, although we most commonly hear it in the New Testament, he also says this, do not defraud or pervert justice or do anything that endangers your neighbor's life. Justice and love in action. Justice is love in action. It's bringing about shalom. Justice is something that we owe our neighbor. Now, our neighbor isn't just someone who's the same social class as us or the same means as us. Hopefully, you would have seen that in our reading today from Luke 10. It's not, who, it's not people who are like you or who like you or who you like. In the Old Testament, God told Israel they had to recognize the immigrant, the single parent family, and the poor as their neighbors. I want to be really clear. It's not just people who are like you, who like you, or who you like. And of course, our reading today, Luke chapter 10, the good Samaritan is anyone who, sorry, the good Samaritan and our neighbor is anyone you come into contact with who lacks basic resources. The Samaritan and the Jew were not friends. They were not kind to one another. They hated each other. They were different races, different classes. But the Samaritan used that space to give the basic resources back to the Jew who was unable to fend for himself. He shouldered the burden. He carried the Jew. He paid the price. It cost him financially. It cost his reputation. Our neighbor is someone who you come into contact with who lacks basic resources. Even if they come from a background that isn't well respected, or even if they're hated by you or not liked by you, your neighbor is anyone in need. How about this? Isaiah 58, God addresses some really religious people. You know, some people who were always doing services, they were always praying together, they were always fasting, they were always making a show of it, and they were like trying to be quite pious. And God says to them, he says this, he says, is this not the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice, to untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke. 
this is what it really means to seek me, he's saying. This is a real spiritual fast. This is what it means to really spiritually fast. So what does this mean? God goes on in Isaiah 58. Stop paying your workers low wages, he says. Stop dealing with dissension with violence. You must take your food and your clothing and your shelter and share it with those who do not have it. That's what it means to do justice. There's a myriad of things that are in our world today that we need to do in order to bring justice. And some of them are these. You know, maybe it's working for change within our social structure, within our government, looking out for the least last and the lost through social policies. Maybe it's working together for better, better wages. I'm sure you've seen the Living Wage Project, in the way that people are advocating for better wages for our people. It's advocating against domestic violence, for refugees, for migrants, for immigrants, for better jobs, for better working conditions. And whatever it is, there's a myriad of things to do. But what it can boil down to is this. Charity. Individual generosity. We are to meet the concrete human needs of our neighbours and all the people around us. Even when, the people, even when it's the people that we might dislike or hate and we must do it all with sacrificial love. Jesus draws on Isaiah 58, and this is why it's so important to continue to read our Old Testament and the overarching narrative that this brings us back into relationship with God. Because Jesus draws on Isaiah 58 in Matthew 25, and he speaks about Judgment Day, where we're told that people who are lost will be seated on one side, and those who are saved will be seated on the other side. Maybe you've heard it before. And if not, jump into Matthew 25 and have a look. He says, To those who are lost, depart from me into the eternal life, fire. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you didn't invite me. I needed clothes and you didn't clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you didn't look after me. And the lost will answer this. Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or as a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and we didn't help you? And the Lord will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. This is what Jesus is saying. Catch this. If you do not love the poor, if you do not love the hungry, the wanderer, the homeless, if you do not love them, no matter what you say, you don't love me. This is the same emphasis that we see in the Old Testament. Like in places like Proverbs chapter 14, where it says, He who oppresses the poor shows contempt for their maker, but whoever is kind to the needy honors God. Proverbs 19 verse 17 says this, He who is kind to the poor lends to the Lord. Now, this next piece I found rather difficult, and Tim Keller puts it like this, but I want you to chew through it with me. Basically, in other words, God is saying, a strong social conscience, a life poured out in deed of service to others, especially to the poor, is the inevitable sign of a real relationship with God, a real faith. You might think that you have a very close connection to God, but these texts are saying, if you do not love the poor, you do not have the relationship that you think you have. Because justice is the index of real faith. The index of real relationship with God. The real spiritual condition of your heart. When Jesus says, when you love the poor, you love me. And then you trample on the poor, then you trample on me. And when God says in Proverbs, when you lend to the poor, you lend to me. And when you insult the poor, you insult me. Insult me, sorry. What this is saying, and this is so powerful, is that God identifies with the poor and with the oppressed. This is not a God who sits above and only sits with those who have means. This is a God who identifies with the poor and the oppressed. Do you want to know how far God went to identify with the poor and the oppressed? And maybe you're already there with me, but let's go. God came to earth in Jesus Christ, born in a feeding trough. 
He lived and ate with the lowest caste of society. And in the end, he rode in on a borrowed donkey and he ate his last meal in a borrowed room. And when it was all said and done and he died, he was buried in a borrowed tomb. God became poor. He didn't just become poor in his means. He became oppressed. He became a victim of injustice. Jesus' Jesus's arrest was just filled with illegalities and miscarriages of justice. Not just poor, but a victim of injustice. Not just for us, but with us. In a world filled with injustices, as I mentioned, and I'm sure you can conjure up all those injustices that you can think of around the world. In a world filled with injustices, we know a God who was subjected to them himself. What this means is that on the last day, when we stand before the Lord, and if we say to him, Lord, when did we see you naked? When did we see you thirsty or as a prisoner? Jesus will be able to say, don't, don't you remember? They cast lots for my garments. I was naked and I said that I thirst and I was hung on a cross and I was a prisoner. God literally became one of the oppressed. God literally took on the yoke. Why? Why do that? Because Jesus, who deserved vindication for doing nothing wrong, got condemnation. So that we as humans, who have over and over and over again messed up, screwed it up, made bad decisions, this world deserves, as we as humans who have messed up this world, and who deserve condemnation, we get vindication and pardon. And this is the beautiful piece. Jesus Christ plunged himself into our lives in order to save us. We have been saved by someone who owes us nothing but rejection. And it's the experience of that grace that leads us to act justly to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Jesus Christ came to earth, and he identified with the poor and the oppressed. And when he comes back to establish absolute shalom on every square inch of this world, as he began to do when he defeated the powers of sin and death upon the cross. And if you want people to know shalom, if you want people to know Christ, then tell them the gospel and take your time and your money and your love and your efforts and do justice. And if you have begun to experience inner shalom in your own life, maybe you're experiencing the renewal in your own heart through the series, through the encounter with Jesus, that inner shalom that comes from knowing God the Father through the gift of our Lord, sorry, through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, then resolve to have that shalom felt everywhere between people and people, people and God, and begin to reweave the fabric of creation. That is who we are called to be as people who carry the gospel with us, whose lives have been transformed by the gospel. We are called because of the grace of the gospel that we have felt in our own lives, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who so died for us that we plunge ourselves into the deepest, darkest places where the poor reside, where the oppressed reside, where the injustices of the world reside, and we bring the shalom that has been offered to us. There's this interesting piece that I found as I was reading through some of the material around this, this uh, series. And there's a historian and sociologist, Rodney Stark, that is um, uh, sort of attached to a few quotes that he's been able to 
uh, bring about through the Roman Empire and the way that the reason that Christianity flowed through the Roman Empire and the Roman Greco world was struck by severe huge plagues and epidemics not too dissimilar to what we've experienced in our world, own world over the last couple of years and the stark traces of how the Christians reactions to the plagues differed dramatically from those who maintained faith in traditional polytheistic paganism so those who weren't Christian and they're this this is a quote from Roman Emperor Julian around 360 AD the Empress Galatians or the Christians support not only their poor but ours as well everyone can see that our people lack aid from us and how about this one during the great epidemic most of our brother Christians showed unbound love and loyalty, never sparing themselves, heedless of danger. They took charge of the sick, attending to their every need and ministering to them in Christ. Many in nursing and curing others transferred their death to themselves and died in their stead. The pagans behaved in the very opposite way. At the first onset of the disease, they pushed the sufferers away and fled even from their dearest, throwing them into the roads before they were dead. And this is from the Bishop of Alexandria around 260 AD. There is power in bringing shalom into the places that so desperately need it. That is a way of a visceral relationship with God being tangibly presented to those who don't know the good news of Jesus Christ. And I pray and I encourage each and every one of you that this week, May we dig deep into what it looks like to bring the shalom of God into our midst, in our society, in our place. Hatai isn't a place that suffers from huge injustice or oppression or, or the poor. They are here, but they are around us. We must look and we must do that together. Don't be a rogue agent. Don't be someone who jumps off and fires on all cylinders alone. Gather people around you. Seek the Lord. Look at where we can plunge ourselves into the very fabric of society and reweave that with the shalom of God. So this week, ask yourselves, what stood out to me? What's God saying to me? Where can I bring the shalom of God? In my workplace, as Summer talked about last week, with those around me, my neighbor, who is my neighbor? Is it the person next to me? Is it someone I see walking on the street every day? Is it someone who um, bundles themselves up in a stoop of a building that I walk past on my, on my way to work? Is it someone who lives in my suburb? Is it somebody that I don't know yet? And who are the people around me that I can do that with? Somebody reminded me of the song, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. It is the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that so saved us. There is nothing you can do or will be able to do or can try to do to obtain that more. There's no way for you to earn your way into that grace that so liberates you from the bondage of sin and the, the captiveness of this world. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. And how do we bring that to others? And so, Lord Jesus, as we gather this week within our house church prayer group Bible study together on a Sunday morning, may you so be with us and may we be reminded, captivated and spurred on by your shalom and by your grace and by the offering that you so put yourself in line for us that no matter what we've done or what we can do or what we haven't done, it is just a gift that you are giving us to the freedom of life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Kaki te anō.